Diane Whalen is the subject of uh, tonight's film. And she experienced a call to the priesthood when she was very young and answered that call in whatever ways were available to her through parish ministries, as a Jesuit volunteer, as a social worker, and as a spiritual director. She completed her bachelor's in religious studies, a master's in social work, a master's of arts in ministry, and a doctor of ministry in spiritual direction. And she continues her work of spiritual direction to this day. She and her husband, Bill, have been happily married for 45 years and have two adult daughters. Diane loves people and finds great joy in serving holy wisdom, inclusive Catholic community in Olympia, Washington. And a special shout out. I know that uh, many of Diane's community members are with us tonight. Welcome. And over the past couple of months, I've gotten the real privilege of getting to know, I've had the real privilege of getting to know Anna Michelle Morajon, who is our filmmaker and the director of the film that we'll be seeing tonight. She's from South Florida, and she is fascinated by the stories of people who challenge the norm. A deep curiosity about the world motivates her creative work which explores themes at the intersection of identity, belief, and modern culture. Her most recent short, The Forbidden Call, which we'll be screening tonight, has entered the film festival circuit and is playing in community screenings across the country. A recent graduate of Loyola Marymount University, Anna Michelle is currently executing online engagement strategy as an assistant producer for Patchwork Films. So congratulations, Anna Michelle, on your graduation and blessings to you in, in all of your work. Thank you to both of you for being with us tonight. First of all, uh, I wanna just say congratulations, um, Anna Michelle, on just a, a beautiful uh, piece of work here from, and not only the message that you're sharing, but the way it was filmed, the way it was edited. I know that moment um, when you're showing Diane and then you're about the Roman Catholic wound priests, the text, and then she turns off the light and, and then it's, and then the, the text changes. That always gives me chills because I think of the, the ways in which, you know, our church is putting a light under a bushel basket, is turning out the lights literally in parishes because we refuse to ordain women and married men to the priesthood. So uh, that, that's a moment that for whatever reason just always sends chills um, rushing through me. Um, but I did have a question and uh, I guess it's more of just a, a process one. What inspired you to, to get involved and, and to, make this, to make this film? Yeah. Um, first, thank you so much, everyone, for being here. I'm honestly amazed at how many of you uh, there are, and it's great to see some familiar faces from Holy Wisdom and also a lot of new ones. Um, thank you, Russ. What inspired me, I think, was just um, was curiosity first. I was taking a theology class in college. We started talking about women's ordination. I was raised Catholic, and so honestly, like women's ordination in my experience wasn't something that we had talked about. And so I wanted to learn more, did some research, stumbled upon Roman Catholic women priests. And I was shocked. I was like, wait a second. There are women who are priests and I've never heard of them and they're Catholic. And so immediately I had a ton of questions, a lot of confusion, a lot of tension. And I had this one professor, actually like a literature professor. And he said, um, you know, it was, he was talking about writing, but he said something along the lines of, if you're struggling with something, that means you need to stay on that topic. Don't just switch topics. Don't jump ship. Even if it's easier, like if it's hard, that means that there's something there. So somehow that resonated with me. And even though there was a lot of confusion, um, because it was so new, I just kind of kept going 
met Diane. And I think that's really, I would say that was kind of where it all started for me. Great, thank you. And so, I mean, Diane, you you get this email from Anna Michelle, and I'm sure it's out of the blue, and you know things progress. So, what what inspired you to 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 say yes to this project and to be willing to share your story in this particular way? Well, because I was the first person in uh, Washington State to be doing this. Um, I had had other people ask for interviews. I had have had academics who are doing books or articles or something say, well, can we interview you? Sure, no problem. Um, there was a uh, another documentary that was done about, uh, about Kathleen Belfi Rice, who is another priest in our community and me, uh, by Luke Novovich. Um, and so we had done that. And so it wasn't too scary as far as that went. But I didn't know that Michelle or that Anna Michelle was going to pursue this as about me. We were just talking. Yeah. You know, yeah. We were talking and, and she said, yeah, I'm checking out this women priest thing. And I thought, OK, well, she'll probably get me on a screen somewhere to say, ask me a question and, and great. But what happened was we kept talking and I'm falling in love with this girl because um, you are so brilliant, Anna Michelle, but not only brilliant, but yes, brilliant first, but not only brilliant, but, um, but what I loved was that curiosity that you had. What I had, what I loved was that you were not sure about how you felt about any of this stuff. You were really just opening yourself to learn something and that's the way I am too. I love to learn. I love to explore. I love to question everything. And um, to have a young woman as brilliant and articulate and loving as you to, to ask me about my life and ask me about this call, I was so honored. I am so honored. And, and then to work with you and see how careful, how respectful, how um, prepared, everything was just so lovely. Um, I just, I wanted you to move here, you know? <laughs> Florida is too far away. So, so I was just, I, what I loved was your curiosity, but you engaged me. I wanted to, I wanted to do whatever would be helpful. Besides that, um, part of my vocation, as it has been, has been not just to be a parish priest, but also to kind of get out there and, and let people know about Roman Catholic women priests. And I do it in my own way. A lot of the women priests do it in, in different ways. But, um, but I love to be with groups of people and just see what happens. So um, I had, and I had done a TED talk, so that had gotten some stuff going too. Um, so this was kind of up my alley. It was, but Anna Michelle, you were the you were the selling point there. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, it, it was all a trick. I pretended like I was just getting information, and then I was roping her in. <laughs> no, I know sincere when I hear it. So it was just beautiful. That's, thank you, Diane. Um, yeah, that's one of the remarkable things that I've I've come to learn, and one of the hidden blessings I would say about this pandemic time is the way in which Catholics, who sort of always, you know, were maybe on the sidelines, thought things were had a sense that something was off, that something was wrong, that something didn't make sense, have have had their world opened up and sort of been welcomed into this reform community, whether it's Future Church, Women's Ordination Conference, Dignity, all these places where they can now, Roman Catholic women priest communities, all these places now where, you know, they can go and experience a different way of being church. Um, and one of the 
most beautiful things for me uh, as co-director of Future Church is to watch the relationships that are being formed and made and people who are meeting each other, you know, on opposite ends of the earth and becoming, you know, friends. Um, and, and it's just a beautiful thing to witness and, you know, a real honor to, to have some minor role in that. Um, so I wonder if the two of you could sort of speak to how your relationship has grown over the course of, of the project and, and what it means to you today and sort of what your hopes are for it into the future. Yeah, um, I could start. I think as Diane nicely laid out, it started off with me just kind of sending an email, many Zoom calls. I think from our first meeting though, like we knew we connected. I remember Diane was like, I'm just having so much fun. And we had we just had to do it again. So we were just having a lot of fun. So I think it always started off, uh, you know, from a, a just place of connection, I think, is where it started and where it still is. I think Diane and her husband and even her kids who I haven't met have become somewhat a family to me, friends, and possibly like an informal spiritual director, <laughs> I would say, of Diane as she's answered so many of my spiritual questions. Well, and, and for me, I just said, I, I'd rather have you living close by <laughs> because getting to know you has been such a delight. And it was, we had a lot of times where, yeah. you know, the, in the beginning, it was like, well, I will stay to my hour with you. Yes. To me. I will stay to my hour with you. And I, and, and like I said, I, at the end, I'd say, well, we're just having a lot of fun. You want to do this again? And then we did. So, yeah, um, Anna Michelle, you've been working way too hard um, <laughs> recently, so we haven't had a chance to connect. Yeah. But I know it's because you've been working really hard and getting this film into film festivals, as I know, that's quite a quite a project. But <laughs> um, but you don't have to do that for the rest of your life. So do come back. <laughs> I would love to. That's great. Uh, well, I want to bring in some of the other folks into our conversation. So just give me a moment here and I'm going to give all of you the ability to um, unmute yourselves. But of course, one, one at a time, uh, if you could uh, use the reaction button down at the bottom of your screen that allows you to raise your hand. Uh, I'll see that you've raised your hand and um, go ahead and call on you and you can unmute at that time. Great, we've got Andrea Hoekstra from Seattle. I'm gonna put you on the screen here and you can go ahead and ask your question. Hi, thank you so much. Um, Reverend Whalen, do you, do, do you follow the lectionary? For the most part, we do. Yeah, we do. Um, I think that we've had some movement within our community at different times asking that we incorporate um, a lot of canon, so to incorporate more poetry and things like that. But for the most part, yes, we do follow the, the lectionary. And part of that has been because many of the people who come are coming out of Catholic parishes where they're used to the lectionary. Um, but we do use the inclusive Catholic lectionary um, uh, put out by uh, what, back in Baltimore. Can't think of their names now. But that's, but that's who we use for the most part. And we also sometimes use the comprehensive Catholic lectionary, what, which was written by two of our priests uh, Jane Via, who's actually a, a bishop, and uh, Nancy Corin. So, but we do follow the lectionary schedule for the most part. Thank you. Thank you. Just wanted to um, jump in here and um, mention that it's the Quixote Center um, that that yes. produces that produced the uh, inclusive uh, Catholic Bible. And actually, um, 
we'll have some news about that hopefully in the very near future. Um, let's see, uh, Jeanette, I see you've got your hand raised. If you want, uh, we can go ahead and bring you on the screen if you start your video. If not, you don't have to. You can ask your question over audio too. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, and so I really am a Clevelander. Um, taught Regina High School for 14 years. So high school theology campus minister all over the place in Cleveland and worked at Covenant House and Community. And so now I'm in route to a Benedictine community as a uh, retired person, because I'm an oblate. So I'm going to serve for a year at um, St. Scholastica's in Atchison. Mm. So um, I'm loving this. And um, I've been connected with Future Church for so many years directly and indirectly, but really what I wanted to say was, I'm very, very grateful that um, I'm connected with the, um, the community of St. Hildegard out in Fairport Harbor. And uh, Reverend Dr. Shannon Steringer is a Roman Catholic woman priest, amazing woman. And she actually has, um, is uh, ministering as, as the pastor of her own church out of a uh, out of St. Michael's, which used to be Byzantine, right down the street from St. Anthony's of Padua. And I'm just currently reading her book, which is interesting, called Forbidden Grace. So she just did a whole parallel. It's, um, it's Hildegard of Bingham and her own personal call. And it's, it's a juxtaposition and a, you know, really a synchronistic display of, of their lives together and how there's so many parallels. And and I love being away and I'm able to, you know, connect with the community online. And, you know, there's rosary on Wednesday and evening prayer on, on Monday. So I, I, I just want to say kudos to everybody. I'm really excited and excited about this film coming out because I think Saturday, isn't it the 20th anniversary of the Danu 7? Um, yeah, because I think that's what, you know, I know we're, as the Hildegard community is celebrating that. Um, so I just wanted to give, you know, give a plug for the Hildegard community as well. Um, I don't know if anyone's familiar with it, but there's online liturgy and it's an amazing group in Fairport Harbor, but you don't have to live in Ohio to connect with it. So there you have Great. it. Great, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Jeanette. Um, and you know, we'll follow up. I know that the Roman Catholic women priests have a, um, uh, a page on their website where you can find a community in your local area. So we'll make sure that we we include that in the follow up. So anyone who's interested oh, cool. in finding a community could do that. Yeah, thanks, Jeanette. All right, Lucy, Lucy Rieger, I see you have a question. Yes, hi, Diane. Thank you for showing us the way and Anna Michelle for telling that beautiful story. Uh, but I have a question for you, Diane, and I apologize if I don't know the right way to address you. Oh, Reverend, or... <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> but you're my sister in, in faith and in uh, fellowships. So I, I just love that. But my question to you as a longtime Catholic, does excommunication weigh on you? Short answer, no. <laughs> um, <laughs> Oh, and, and it really didn't. It wouldn't. But it did. But in the very beginning, I was ordained in 2010. And it was the most common question that I was asked because people were very, very concerned about that in the earlier days. The reason I was not concerned about that is I, I equate excommunication with punishment for sin. I knew that I was not sinning. Um, I knew that I was following the Spirit's call. So I experienced, as Anna Michelle shared in the film, I experienced a tremendous amount of grief leaving my parish. It was grief. But I knew that I was doing what I needed to do. And, and the excommunication, the canon that uh, offers us excommunication for this, is an unjust law. And so we need to say no to unjust laws. Otherwise, we're going to be in a worse mess than we're in. So there it is. Thank you, and God bless you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Lucy. 
I see uh, Ryan Bloor, you have a question? Let me see. I'm going to ask you to unmute. There you go. My name is Joy. Joy. Okay, Joy, welcome. Um, this is quite a big moment for me. Um, I'm from New Zealand, uh, Christchurch. I was 77, and I think I have lived with a call cool, uh, to priesthood for many, many decades and have been fearful about voicing it. So this is the very first time that I've said anything. Um, I was a Sister of Mercy for 18 years. And at the very end of that uh, time, I experienced probably what we would now call burnout. I couldn't find a spiritual director who had any understanding of emotional and psychological development. Mm. And nor could I find a, uh, a psychotherapist who had any appreciation for my faith. So my life's task has been to find the bridge between emotional and psychological development and religious belief. My journey uh, involved excommunication. So I have um, some depth of feeling around that because not long after I left, I met again a priest whom I had known in my ministry as a sister of mercy who himself had left without my knowledge. And we went through all the due processes, but um, because it was just at the time when John Paul II put the drawbridge up, my husband uh, was denied um, uh, release from his priestly vows. And uh, so we went ahead and got married, which was probably one of the most difficult uh, things in my life I've ever had to do. Um, we fortunately had a fairly sympathetic bishop who just basically told us to do what we needed to do with his blessing, but he couldn't do any more. Um, my, and I will come to my question, <laughs> my journey took me to train as a psychotherapist here in New Zealand, um, but the models that I was learning did not address the deeper questions that I had. I couldn't find a model to address what I had experienced, which included two very powerful dreams the night I made the decision to leave. I knew nothing about Jung at the time, Carl Jung, but my husband was an avid, very much wanted to become a Jungian analyst. And so I guess I prepared the way for him and then unexpectedly I was invited on the same, it's a big story, <laughs> but I was, in, I, was, I was invited to train at the Institute in Zurich, which was completely unheard of. I'm right from the bottom of the world. And most people here don't know what a Jungian analyst is. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but I, I finally got to Zurich, and which, which really was the journey of my life, and took me into depths. And I found the model to, um, to, to put together the two huge questions that I had in my life. Um, everything that I'd believed in, the lights were just turned on in a way that still staggers me. Um, and in the middle of all that, I came across what I now understood was an experience of the divine feminine. And it completely blew my mind. Um, I was with a Buddhist body therapist as part of my training as an analyst. It was a parallel process. And I was taken into a journey which was very, very demanding. And in that journey, um, I started to work with clay. And to my horror, these images started to come out. And one of them was actually a crucified woman uh, in the holding out her hands in a gesture of a priest. So I basically came back from Zurich in 1997. And for the last 25 years, I've been working here in Christchurch, New Zealand, as an analyst, uh, still a member of the church, um, still participating. I think that the last, it's the experience of Eucharist, but more recently, in the last four or five years, it's been the site of an all-male sanctuary has just become too much for my heart um, and so I think there is a deep call there but at 77 coming up 78 I'm <laughs> I don't think I'm going to see it in my in myself and in my lifetime 
However, I've found a way, I think, and I wanted to ask you, Diane, um, I feel I'm a bridge person. Um, the model of Elizabeth and Mary has been very, very strong in my heart. Um, I think many people forget that Elizabeth was actually the first prophet. She is the one who identified Mary as the bearer of the divine. And yet she probably didn't live to see uh, that. Um, the fullness and the horror, actually, of what happened to the child that she identified. And so I think that I've painfully had to come to the point where the sacrifice that I feel I'm called to make is to bear that suffering in a way that I hope will bear fruit uh, for the next generation. And I was very moved, Diane, by yours and um, Anna Michelle, is it? Relationship. I, I identified that with so profoundly to the joy of seeing a young woman um, just as you described her. So I, I wanted to ask you, Diane, um, I probably, if, if that call, if I could, if I was able to activate that call, I think my model of priesthood for me would be someone who I would love to be able to celebrate Eucharist, mm -hmm. to anoint, um, to assist in reconciliation, and probably as a spiritual director, with, the, with priesthood because I feel in my life I've done the pastoral for a long time in my earlier years and my my longing I think is to bring women in particular and men with them into a much deeper awareness of the of the magnitude of what we are called to and and the, the tremendous treasure that the Roman Catholic Church despite its fragile earthen vessel holds for the world and that's what I've learned through my study of Jung's insights into Catholicism in particular. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to ask you, um, Diane, thank you first for your courage. Um, I was very moved when I saw the two of you sharing. Um, I identified so much with the, the, some of the pain that you expressed. And I just don't know what else to say except to thank you for your courage. Um, and to give me the opportunity to voice something which I've held inside for a long, long time. What did it feel like for you when you felt, when you were finally ordained? What, what was your experience of that, of that call in your being? What difference did it make from knowing you had a call to actually receiving ordination? I felt like I was myself. Yes. Fully myself in yes. a way that I had not experienced before. I guess that's, that's, yeah. yes. that's what I feel in myself. There's something that's not complete. Yeah. Although Joy, you are you're on you're doing the journey. Yes. You're reaching out. You've just made a huge step in in saying this to the world. <laughs> That's a huge thing to be able to do that. Um, also, being in New Zealand, um, there is a group there. I, I don't know if you're familiar with them. Oh, then you must. I will just, um, I'll let you know. Louise Shanley, S-H-A-N-L-Y, is part of our Holy Wisdom community. And she and others have been gathering um, and and they are they're gathering they are church and um they may be a, a beautiful resource for you and i and i would say you don't look like you're on your last legs you could <laughs> pursue oh, no. you could okay. pursue the Roman, other, Roman the other sorry the other difficulty is that about five years ago my husband had uh, unexpected complications from major, major heart surgery. It was a near-death experience. And so I'm almost, I'm caught, not caught, but I, my reality is um, I'm at in terms of my husband. And and again, it's like, what is God telling me through this? I would, I would encourage you to um, get a hold of Louise. Um, look up progressive Catholic women in New Zealand and uh, I don't even know. Louise might even be on this and might be.
be able to put something in the chat. But yeah. I would encourage you. I would encourage you. And I I just give you my blessing. And thank you. Bye. Thank Is you. it possible to be able to contact you sometime? Yes. Yes. Um I'm not, yeah. Yeah. I'll, yeah. Go through I'll, I'll connect you too. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, thank you okay. very much. And, yeah. and thank you for yeah. all the other wonderful women that are there. I noticed there's somebody from Australia, so I didn't feel quite so isolated. <laughs> but uh, but thank you. Thank you. Very, and, very much. God thank you, Joy, you. for sharing thank your story with us. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, okay, let's see. Uh, Mary Springer, we have about 14 more minutes. So Mary Springer, um, there's a few more questions. Let me bring you up here. Okay. Oh, Mary, could you go ahead and unmute and I'll get the others back on screen. I'm sorry. Can't hear her. She has it on mute. Mary, um, let's see. I'm going to try sending you. There you a go. Request. And I think oh, there we go. Out. Yep. Okay. Um, that was an incredible documentary, and I was very moved by it. I am wondering, Diane, um, if you know Mary Rammerman at Spiritus Christi in Rochester. I went to college with her, and and then was back in Rochester, and. I remember um, she was is an ordained priest, but I I thought that it was the American Catholic or the Universal Catholic or the term is a little different. Can you tell me if you know uh, of Mary, and if so, what is the difference between um, between the two priesthoods? Okay, um, I do not know Mary, but I have met Mary. And I read Jim Callahan's book about them and the experience at Spiritus Christi. I have a lot of respect for Mary. Yeah. Um, she was, I, I believe, the first priest ordained. And she was ordained by um, Peter Hickman, who right. was a bishop from the old Catholic Church, which has now called the Ecumenical Catholic Communion. The difference is. And, and I'm not quite sure, I know that she was ordained by him, but I she was not ordained, as far as I know, she wasn't ordained under the auspices of the Ecumenical Catholic Communion. I'm not quite sure about that, because I don't, I don't remember if it was in the book, but I, I know the difference between them. The Ecumenical Catholic Communion is kind of a, um, is a new name for the, old Catholic Church that started in Germany, I believe, in the 1870s after Vatican I, when, um, when the idea of infallibility of the Pope came up. There were a bunch of people in Germany that just said, that's ridiculous. You know, that is ridiculous. We're not going to go along with this. We are the real, the old Catholic Church, and let them take off with their infallible stuff. So, um, so that is where Peter Hickman landed, and there are um, there are other groups, and but the Ecumenical Catholic Communion is one that has several different communities around in uh, in the United States, and they may be elsewhere, but they are part of a group that left the Roman Catholic Church in the 1870s. Roman Catholic women priests, um, we continue to call ourselves Roman Catholic, and I speak for myself for the same reason. I mean, I said it on the, on the film, so that we can be um, prophets, if you will. We can say we are still Roman Catholic, or I, I will say for myself, I am still Roman Catholic, I am a Roman Catholic woman priest ordained by this group, Roman Catholic women priests, and I will keep that title because the institution is threatened by it and mm -hmm. it has things to move. Mm -hmm. um, the way I put it in the film was if I were to join the Episcopalians or the old Catholic Church or the Ecumenical Catholic Communion or any of the other ones, they would just say goodbye. 
glad right. you're gone. Get out of our business. <laughs> <laughs> Why would I do that? It's it's much more interesting to do it this yeah. way. Yeah. Can you tell me who you were ordained by? Yeah. Uh, well, the yeah, I was ordained through Roman Catholic women priests by um, Bishop Olivia Doko. Okay. Thank you so much. And thank you for all that you do. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mary. Let's see, Pat Pickett, I see you have a question. Yes, I do. Um, when I was in divinity school, um, we had to be a student pastor in a denomination other than our own. And so since I was the only Catholic at Colgate, <laughs> I <laughs> could go anywhere. And I did. At the end of that time, um, the deacons had a meeting and they voted, they asked me to be their pastor. And I was, and they said, you can remain Catholic. Doesn't matter to us. I went to our bishop and he said, Pat, you can't do that. The church doesn't call women yet. <laughs> and I, I, I stood there and I said, well, what if God does? <laughs> and and he, he had tears and he, he was for women's ordination, but he left me standing in his office by myself. And I went to the church and said, okay. And that really meant the end of my marriage. It meant the end of my connection with the church. Um, and there are a lot of us out here who had no place to go. However, Mary Rammerman came along four or five years after I did that, but I had already moved. I'd been ordained in a, in a Protestant, and I still am, but I'm still Catholic. I say that too. And I say, and what the, my denomination, are, what some people who are coloring outside the lines also say is that I'm a hybrid because I'm both. And I won't take that excommunication either. I didn't. I didn't do it to me. Right. And so I just want to thank you for sharing your story and, and just know we support women priests, but we've, some of us have been ordained now in other traditions. And um, unfortunately, I mean, that's our path. Right. But we're still Catholic. At least we think we, we say we are. And I just want you to know we're with you. Thank you for sharing. Thank you, Pat. And thank you for that, the courage that you had to follow that call that you had, that you have. And, and also that deep knowing that you, you have Catholic bones and there ain't too much you can do about that. Is <laughs> That's true. <laughs> thank, you. Thank, thank you. Thanks, Pat. Uh, I see that Rich Landfield, do you have a question? Um, yes, I have. Um... A comment um, related to the question to Diane about how do people ad address you? And then I have a question. And I have a long, long time friend who's a, a woman. She's a priest in the Episcopal Church. And I call her Mother Father. Mm -hmm. um, my question is, um, and based on an observation that uh, most of the male priests that I know um, talk with other male priests about theological questions, practical questions, uh, management of parishes, all sorts of things that fall under the rubric of being a, basically a parish priest. Are, are you able to talk to male priests about theology questions or how they handle problems that may be similar to the, I imagine, to the problems that you face? I have. Um, I have talked with some friends who are male priests, but, um, but some of our problems are different than the problems that they have. A lot of our, our friends who are priests struggle with the institution. And I don't have to struggle with the institution. What I deal with is, um, is communal discernment and those kinds of things. So we have a group of clergy people 
in Olympia, in the Olympia area, called Concerned Clergy. Most of us are involved with social justice kind of issues. So a lot of times I would talk with those folks because, um, because they're local, they know what's going on here, and, um, and they are pastoring communities. But, and I also have the other Roman Catholic women priests who are friends. And if I have questions or um, struggles with something, I know that I can go to many of them and, uh, and be able to hash things out. So uh, that's that's pretty much where we would go. Well, I, I guess in a, in a way I'm asking whether the fact that you've been excommunicated poses a barrier for other priests to talk with you. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I mean, I would meet them in secret for sure. Um, yeah, no, there, in fact, I was, I approached uh, someone in a crowd. It was a, um, it was at a Jesuit event, a Jesuit volunteer event, what, what it was. And I approached a priest that was not a close friend, but was an acquaintance one time. And he just kind of looked at me, he smiled, and he turned away because people didn't want to be seen with me. He didn't want to be seen with me. So those kinds of things happen. Um, you know, that's part of the price that we pay, you know, mm. and that's not true. Right. For there, we do have some women priests who have, who are welcomed in their parishes to do ministry. We have, um, our Christine who's in Austria, who was actually the founder the, the original idea person for RCWP is recognized as a bishop in her town by the Catholic bishop and the Catholic people. So it, it just depends on who you are and wh who your bishop is, at, which is true for a lot of us. Thank you. Thank you. Right, thanks, Rich. We only have a few more minutes. I'm going to try to, uh, you know, if we could try to keep our questions succinct. We'll try to get as many of them in as possible. Thanks. I'm going to bring up Suzanne here. Well, speaking of bishops, um, I have a posted here. Hi, Diane. Um, mm -hmm. Some things I want to just quickly say. Um, quite frankly, the most common question is, what do we call you? Over and over again, I've heard hundred hundreds of people ask that. So that seems to be, for some reason, the number one question, and you've answered it, usually our first names. Sometimes we'll say Reverend when we're doing a a funeral or something. Um, the excommunication is definitely in the old days would have been a shunning. We would be in a village and we would have been terribly shunned. That it doesn't seem to be an issue. And I think, as you said, most of us are, uh, it, we don't pay a lot of attention to it. Um, however, men, there are many males priests that have been and bishops that are supportive of us, but really can't say much or they like Roy Bourgeois or are somehow shunned in that case or lose their uh, their retirement or there's all kinds of quote little punishments. So the men um, I wish would step up a little bit and speak out a little more for us, but I can understand why they're not. There are 276 of us worldwide. Our anniversary is actually June 29th, Wednesday. That's the actual date. And there is a, will be a, a, a ceremony or a, a, a thing in uh, Berkeley, California. And it is true that Shannon Sharon uh, is doing one in Fairpoint uh, a little bit earlier. I bet you would think we're all um, very progressive, but actually we have quite a diversity in the movement. And we have some pretty traditional priests and some very, very progressive uh, women and communities. So I um, suggest you go to our website, and it's very easy to remember, just run the words together, Roman Catholic Women Priest.org, and there you are. You don't even have to uh, put it up on the chat list. It's Roman Catholic Women Priest.org. Go down, it says find a worshiping community. There are about 80 of them worldwide, and we, I know, are all open to having anybody come and are very inclusive and are also uh, online, many of them, um, and now are starting kind of a hybrid. So you're more than welcome to check some of those out. And when it comes to being a bishop, um, we maintain that we have apostolic succession. So my paperwork has five or six popes in it. It's as good as any male 
and we maintain our ordinations are valid, but what we call illicit against that canon law, a couple of canon laws. So again, I encourage you, there are 400 and some of you to check us out and go to that website. It's easy to remember. So, um, and Diane, it's good to see you. Thank you. Thanks, Suze. Thank you. So we are coming up on the hour here, but I do know that Deborah has a question um, for um, Anna Michelle. So I want to bring Deborah into the conversation. Hi, Anna. Thank you, Anna Michelle. Thank you so much for all your work that you've put into this. And obviously, you can see that you've inspired a lot of people. Um, I have a question about the uh, you're putting this out in festivals, and I want to know how that happened, how that works. And um, will you be touring around at these festivals and giving presentations? Yeah, thank you for asking. So right now, actually, I think it was like two weeks ago, not this past weekend, but the weekend before I was in Atlanta. So it was accepted at a festival called Atlanta DocuFest. So it depends on the festival. You don't have to go if it gets into a festival, but I did share the forbidden call with a community in Atlanta. Um, it was, you know, it's very different setting than this one because not everyone was Catholic or religious. So I didn't know how people would react. Um, but really a lot of curiosity, a lot of interest. There was a Q and A portion, a lot of questions from people. And I think that's really exciting for me because, and this is something Diane talked about. Diane did a Ted talk, but I don't, I think it was the best Ted talk. So I'll always kind of shout that out. But something Diane said in her Ted talk was that this has like worldwide impact because Catholicism is growing rapidly in areas, I think like Latin America and Africa, which, so this really becomes a global women's issue because who you have in leadership um, affects how women are treated, how women are perceived. So anyway, so that's kind of part of my mentality in bringing this around in festivals is like, this affects everyone. So this isn't just a Catholic issue. This is just a Christian issue. This affects all women and all people. So um, for applying for festivals, there's a ton of festivals out there. Um, I've been very selective in my process. So finding festivals that are interested in women's issues, LGBT issues. Um, I don't think I've found any uh, spirituality oriented ones yet. A lot of social justice ones. Um, and sometimes like random people email me and are like, can you, uh, or would you be interested in spending to our festival? So I do a couple of those too. Um, so yeah, it's definitely just finding the right festivals and audiences um and that's through just google i don't know if that answers your question but i am somewhat touring depending on where the festival is um but we're at just the beginning okay and i'm from seattle and i'm friends with diane so we might have to find ways to bring you out here because there's lots of good festivals out this way right diane yes. bellingham, <laughs> where i live in bellingham so we have a human rights film festival and um october is doc uh october I don't know how they call it, but anyway, it's a documentary month at the Pickford Theater. And nice. Canada, but it would be fun to have you out this way. I think I did apply to one in Seattle, if I'm not wrong. So maybe you guys will see me out there. Yeah, look up Bellingham too, Pickford Theater. Oh, yeah. Awesome, thank you. Which is north of Seattle. Great, thank, thank you. you so much, Deborah. Thank you for that question and uh, the suggestions. And thank you to all of you for joining us and for the wonderful conversation I was seeing going on in the chat, the wonderful conversation that was uh, happening here on screen. Uh, thank you for, for being a part of this evening that I know was very special for me and I hope was very special for all of you. Congratulations, Anne Michelle, on this film. It's fantastic. And as you can see, it inspires conversation and um, encourage, uh, which is just such a beautiful thing. So, so thank you for the ministry that, that you've provided through this film. And thank you to Diane for being a prophet and um, you know, being Catholic and being a priest and um, allowing us to tap into a little bit of your story tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Russ. And I wanna thank Deb too. And Anna Michelle, of course, what a beautiful opportunity for us. Thank you. Yes, and thank you. So sorry to anyone who I may not have responded to directly in the comments. I'm trying to 
uh, get to everyone, but thank you uh, for the kind words and for being here today and for your openness to Diane, to me and to the film. Thank you. Great, thank you both. I'm gonna turn things over to Deb to close us out with a prayer. Thank you, Anna Michelle, and Diane, and all of you who joined us tonight. The story is uh, really touching because it really captures the humanity of, of someone moving through that process, that spiritual path. And uh, I really appreciate that. 